Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over section 1, i.e. the multiple choice questions from the 2018 SQA National 5 Physics exam paper. Now, there are 25 questions in this section, and I recommend that you try them yourself before looking at these solutions. So let's get started. Question 1 says, which of the following is a scalar quantity? Well, remember, a scalar quantity is a quantity that has a magnitude or size only. It doesn't have a direction. So if we look at these, velocity, displacement, acceleration, force, and speed, the only one here that is a scalar that doesn't have a direction is speed, because force, acceleration, displacement, and velocity all have a direction. So our answer here is E. Question 2 says, a security guard starts at the corner of a warehouse, walks around the warehouse as shown, and arrives back at the same corner. So they start here and move 50 metres north, 120 metres east, 50 metres south, and then 120 metres west. And they, end, and they end up back where they were to begin with. It then says, which row in the table shows the total distance walked by the security guard and the magnitude of the displacement of the security guard from the start to the end of the walk? Well, to find the total distance, we simply just need to add up the distances here. So we have 50 plus 120 plus 50 plus 120, which gives us 340 metres for the total distance. So that means our answer is either going to be D or E here. And to find the magnitude of the displacement, that just means the size of the displacement without a direction, we firstly just need to think about what displacement actually is. Remember it's the shortest distance from the start to the finish point of the journey. And in this case, remember the security guard ends up back where they were to begin with. So that means the displacement has to be zero because the distance between the start and end point is zero. So that means we're looking at these as our correct answers. So our answer here is D. Question 3 says that a ball is thrown vertically upwards. The ball reaches its maximum height. Which of the following describes the forces acting on the ball at this instant? So we've got there's no vertical force acting on the ball. There's only a horizontal force acting on the ball. There's an upward force acting on the ball. The forces acting on the ball are balanced. And there's only a downward force acting on the ball. Well, let's think about the ball at its maximum height. It's no longer going to have a force acting upwards on it, so we can eliminate C, which says there is an upward force acting on the ball. And that's because the ball is no longer going to move upwards. In fact, it's going to start travelling downwards and accelerate downwards. And the reason it's going to start accelerating downwards is due to the force of gravity. So the statement here, there is only a downward force acting on the ball, that is a potential correct answer there. The forces acting on the ball are balanced. Well, remember for balanced forces, that is going to mean that the object either remains at rest or it travels at a constant speed due to Newton's first law. But if we know the ball is going to accelerate downwards due to gravity, then that's not going to be an option. And we can eliminate anything to do with horizontal forces because the ball is moving vertically only, it has no horizontal motion. And the ball, we said, will in fact have a force downwards due to gravity. So the statement that there is no vertical force acting on the ball has to be false. So the correct answer here has to be E. There is only a downward force acting on the ball when it's at its maximum height. Question 4 says a motor is used to apply a force of 120 newtons to a box of 30 kilograms. So you see we've got a motor here which is pulling the box with a force of 120 newtons. It then says the box moves at a constant speed across a horizontal surface. The box moves at a distance of 25 metres in a time of 5 seconds. Which row in the table shows the work done on the box and the minimum output power of the motor? Well, let's calculate the work done first of all using the equation for work done EW equals FD. And let's sub in the numbers. So looking back at the picture, we had 120 newtons for the force and we have a distance of 25 metres. So substituting in our numbers, we have 120 times 25 and putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 3000 joules. And next we want to calculate the minimum output power. So notice how we've now got an energy and we were also given a time of 5 seconds in the question. So writing down our equation for power in terms of energy and time, we have P equals EW over T, where I've just called the energy E subscript W here because that was our work done energy. And now substituting in the numbers, we have 3000 divided by 5.0 seconds, which gives us a final answer of 600 watts once you put it into your calculator. And so you can see that answer C gives us a work done of 3000 joules and a minimum output power of 600 watts. So the answer here is C. Question 5 says a galaxy is a collection of. Well, this is simply a definition of what a galaxy is. Remember, a galaxy is a collection of stars. Question 6 says the communication satellite Iridium-124 has a period of 97 minutes and an orbital height of 630 kilometres. 
the geostationary satellite Astra 5B has a period of 1,440 minutes and an orbital height of 36,000 km. A satellite with an orbital height of 23,000 km has a period of, well this is simply just a bit of problem solving or pattern spotting, and you can hopefully see that since the 23,000 km lies between the two orbital heights given, i.e. the 630 km and the 36,000 km, then the period must lie between the two periods given as well, because remember the orbital height is essentially just a distance, and the period is essentially just a time, so the bigger the orbital height, the bigger the orbital period, i.e. the further away a satellite satellite is from an object that it's orbiting, the longer the time it's going to take to orbit that thing. More specifically, we can say the period must lie between 97 minutes and 1440 minutes. And you can see here we have 62 minutes, 97 minutes, so we can rule those out because they are not between these two values. We then get 835 minutes, which does lie between these two values, and then 1440 and 2250, they do not lie within this range. So that means my answer has to be C here, 835 minutes. Question 7 says, far out in space, the rocket engine of a space probe is switched on for a short time, causing it to accelerate. When the engine is then switched off, the probe will slow down until it stops, follow a curved path, continue to accelerate, move at a constant speed, or change direction. Well, when the engine is switched off, the probe no longer has a thrust force acting on it, and therefore it's going to have balanced forces. So we can say that the probe will move at a constant speed. Question 8 says that a spacecraft lands on a distant planet. The gravitational field strength on this planet is 14 newtons per kilogram. Which row in the table shows how the mass and weight of the spacecraft on this planet compares with the mass and weight of the spacecraft on Earth? Well remember mass stays the same no matter where you are or what planet you're on in the universe. So that means the mass of the spacecraft on this planet must be the same as the mass of the spacecraft on Earth. So we can say the mass is going to be the same as on Earth. So that means we can eliminate B and D as options. We're looking at A, C or E as the answer. And then to work out the weight on the planet, we can think about the equation W equals mg. We're saying the mass on the planet is going to stay the same, and if we want to work out what's going to happen to the weight, we need to think about the gravitational field strength and the difference between the values. So on this planet, the value is 14 newtons per kilogram for g, and on Earth, it's only 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So we've got a bigger g value on the distant planet, which means we're going to have a bigger weight than on the Earth for this spacecraft. So we're looking at same as an Earth for the mass and greater than an Earth for the weight, so our answer has to be A. Question 9 says the distance from the Sun to the star Sirius is 8.6 light years. This distance is equivalent to, well in this kind of question we need to convert from 8.6 light years into meters because that's the units of the answers that we're given. So converting from light years into meters, remember we can do this in one of two ways. You can either remember the value for one light year in meters, which is 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters, and simply just multiply the 8.6 by this value, 9.46 times 10 to the 15, which should give you 8.1 times 10 to the 16 meters, which is the answer D. However, if you're going to struggle to remember that number, remember you could also convert from light years into meters by doing a speed distance time calculation. So instead you could use D equals V T, distance equals speed times time, and remember the speed here is going to be the speed of light because we're talking about light, and the time is going to be the time for one year in seconds. So we have 3 times 10 to the 8 times 365 days times 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds and multiply this by the 8.6 light years it's because remember it's just this speed times the time that's going to give us the number of meters in one light year. So we want to times that by the 8.6. So putting that into your calculator will give us the same answer as above 8.1 times 10 to the 16 meters which is the answer D. Moving on, we have question 10, which says light from a star is split into a line spectrum of different colours. The line spectrum from the star is shown along with the line spectra of the elements X, Y and Z. The elements present in this star are. Well, remember to find out which elements are present in the star, we need all of the lines from each element to match up with lines that are in the spectrum from the star. So if we look at element X to begin with, you can see this line matches up with this one, this line matches with this one, this thicker one matches with this one, and then these three also match up. So element X we could say is present in the star. For element Y we can see we've got these two thin lines, and these also appear in the star. If we get this thicker one and this thinner one here, they also match up. We've then got this one and this one which also match up. So we could also say that element Y is present in the star. Lastly, element Z, we've got this one here matching with this one. 
This one here does not match up with any in the star though, so we can eliminate element Z from being in the star. So we're looking at elements X and Y, so that is going to be C. Question 11 says a student makes the following statements about AC and DC circuits. Statement 1 says in an AC circuit the direction of the current changes regularly. Statement 2, in a DC circuit negative charges flow in one direction only. And statement 3, in an AC circuit the size of the current varies with time. Which of these statements is or are correct? Well let's look through each statement and decide which ones are true or false. So statement 1, in an AC circuit the direction of the current changes regularly. Well that is true from the definition of alternating current. So remember alternating current is when a current changes direction every fraction of a second. So the direction must change regularly. Statement 2, in a DC circuit negative charges flow in one direction only. Well that is also true from the definition of direct current, which says that electrons flow in one direction only and electrons have a negative charge, so that is the negative charge is the electrons. And lastly, in an AC circuit the size of the current varies with time. Well we know that the direction changes, but it's also the case that the size changes with time as well, so that is also true. So for an alternating current, the magnitude or the size and the direction changes with time. So that means we have all three statements are correct, which gives an answer of E. Question 12 says an electric field exists around two point charges Q and R. The diagram shows the path taken by a charged particle as it travels through the field. The motion of the particle is as shown. So you can see that the path comes along and then it bends towards charge Q and then it bends away from charge R. And then it says which row in the table identifies the charge on the particle, the charge in Q and the charge in R. Well for the particle to be attracted towards Q then they must have opposite charges. And then for the particle to be repelled away from R it must have the same charge as R. So let's look at the columns for the charge in the particle and the charge in R. And let's find where these charges are the same first of all. So we've got positive and negative for A negative and negative for B, so that's an option, negative and positive for C, positive and positive for D, so that's also an option, and positive and negative for E. So our two options here were B or D, because we'll get negative, negative, positive, positive, and then we just need charge Q to be the opposite charge to those. So here for B, we can see they're all actually the same charge, negative, 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 so that's not going to be the right answer. We're looking at D, where we have positive and positive, and negative. So let's just put those charges in and check that they make sense. So if the particle is positively charged, Q is negatively charged and R is positively charged, then the positively charged particle will become in and be attracted towards the negatively charged particle Q and then it's going to be repelled away from the positively charged particle R. So that means our answer is D. Question 13 says a transistor switching circuit is set up as shown. So we've got 0 volts here and plus Vs to supply voltage here. We then get a variable resistor, a thermistor, a transistor and an LED. It then says the variable resistor is adjusted until the LED switches off. The temperature of the thermistor is now increased. The resistance of the thermistor decreases as the temperature increases. Which row in the table describes the effect of this change in the voltage across the thermistor, the voltage across the variable resistor, and whether the LED stays off or switches on? Well, if we look back at the information in the question, we were told that the resistance of the thermistor decreases as the temperature increases. So if you think about the steps in explaining how these transistor switching circuits or control circuits work, then we've sort of been told the first step here. We're told that the temperature of the thermistor is increased, so temperature goes up, and we're told that as the temperature goes up, the resistance of the thermistor goes down, it decreases. So our next step would be that if we know that the resistance of the thermistor decreases, then we can say what happens to the voltage across the thermistor. So if its resistance decreases, then remember voltage does the same thing as resistance because the two are proportional from Ohm's law. So we can say that as resistance of the thermistor decreases, the voltage across it also decreases. And that means that if the voltage across this one decreases, then the voltage across the variable resistor must increase. And that's because, remember, these two are connected in a potential divider circuit. So the two components here take a share from the supply voltage, and if this thermistor now takes a smaller share, from the supply voltage, then the variable resistor must take a greater share from the supply voltage. So the voltage across the variable resistor will increase. So if we look here, we should have decreases and then increases, and that in fact answers the question for us. So it should be A because that's the only option which has decreases and then increases. And then let's see what happens to the LED just to be sure. So because this voltage across the lower component is increasing, then remember the voltage across the transistor is equal to the voltage across this lower component. 
So if this one is increasing, then the voltage across the transistor must increase. And that means that if the LED is initially off and the voltage across the transistor increases above its switch on voltage, then that's going to switch on, which in turn switches on the LED. So our LED should switch on, so that means our answer is going to be A. Question 14 says three resistors are connected as shown. So we've got two terminals X and Y, we've then got a 12 ohm resistor in series with a parallel combination of two 12 ohm resistors. Then says the resistance between X and Y is. Well, this is a combination circuit where we're going to do the parallel combination first, then add on our total resistance from there to our 12 ohms. So you can do this in a quick way, which I'll show you later, or you can do the more kind of standard longer way, which I'll show you first. So let's use the equation for the resistance in parallel. So we have 1 over RT equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, which equals 1 over 12 plus 1 over 12, which simplifies to 2 over 12. And then we need to flip both sides to get RT on its own. So we get RT equals 12 over 2, which is the same as 6 ohms. We can then do RT equals R1 plus R2. So we just add our 12 ohms to our 6 ohms that we just found for the answer. And that gives us 18 ohms. So our answer here is C. However, I said there was a quicker way, and there is, because you might remember the trick when we've got resistors in parallel that have identical values. So because this is 12 ohms and this is 12 ohms, then I can actually take the value of one of them and divide by how many resistors I have in parallel. So I take 12 ohms and divide by 2 because I've got two resistors here. So that gives me 6 ohms for this combination, and I add it to the 12, which gives me 18 ohms. So that's a very quick way of doing this question. But remember, the warning here is that that trick only works when these values in parallel are identical. Next, we have question 15, which says the filament of a lamp has a resistance of 4.0 ohms. The lamp is connected to a 12 volt supply. The power developed by the lamp is... Well, notice how we're given a voltage and a resistance and we're asked to calculate power. So we want to use one of our four power equations, the one that involves the relationship between power, voltage and resistance. So that is P equals V squared over R. Substituting in the numbers gives us 12 squared over 4.0. And then putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 36 watts, which gives an answer here of B. Question 16 says a block of wax is initially in the solid state. The block of wax is then heated. The graph shows how the temperature of the wax changes with time. So we'll get temperature in the y-axis against time in minutes on the x-axis. And it then says the melting point of the wax is. Well, looking back at the picture, we want to find where the melting point is. Well, we're told the wax starts off in the solid state. So at this point here, it's solid. And we apply heat to the solid to increase its temperature until it reaches this point here where it's going to start melting. So that is where its melting point is. So we could put a wee cross there to show that is the melting point. So we're asked for the temperature of the melting point. So we're looking at this scale here. So that corresponds with 40 degrees Celsius. So I can say my answer here is C. Question 17 says that the pressure of the air outside an aircraft is 0.4 times 10 to the 5 pascals. The air pressure inside the aircraft cabin is 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals. The area of an external cabin door is 2 meters squared. The outward force in the door due to the pressure difference is. Well, we're trying to find a force here. We know a couple of pressures and also the area. So in order to find the outward force due to the pressure difference, we need to find the pressure difference between these two values. So let's find the pressure difference first of all, which is going to be P equals 1 times 10 to the 5 minus the 0.4 times 10 to the 5, which gives us 0.6 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And now we can use our area and our pressure difference to calculate the force. So we have P equals F over A. Rearranging for the force F, we get P times A, so F equals PA. Substituting in the numbers, we get 0.6 times 10 to the 5 for the pressure difference, times the 2 meters squared for the area. And putting that into your calculator, or just doing it in your head, gives you an answer of 1.2 times 10 to the 5 newtons. So that gives us the answer C. Question 18 says a solid at a temperature of minus 20 degrees Celsius is heated until it becomes a liquid at 70 degrees Celsius. The temperature change in Kelvin is. Well, remember, a temperature change in Kelvin is the same as a temperature change in degrees Celsius. So we just need to find the difference between these two in degrees Celsius, and that will tell us the temperature change in Kelvin. So we have delta T, the change in temperature, equals T2 minus T1, which is equal to the 70 minus minus 20, which is the same as 70 plus 20, which is 90 degrees Celsius. So that means that my temperature change in Kelvin is 90 Kelvin, which is B. 
Question 19 says that a sealed bicycle pump contains 4 times 10 to the minus 5 meters cubed of air at a pressure of 1.2 times 10 to the 5 pascals. The piston of the pump is pushed in until the volume of air in the pump is reduced to 0.8 times 10 to the minus 5 meters cubed. During this time, the temperature of the air in the pump remains constant. The pressure of the air in the pump is now. So in this question, notice how we're dealing with volume and pressure changing and temperature stays the same. So this is a Boyle's Law question, otherwise known as the Pressure Volume Law. So let's write down our equation for Boyle's Law, P1 V1 equals P2 V2, and we're trying to find P2 here, the pressure of the air in the pump. So we have 1.2 times 10 to the 5, that was our initial pressure, times the initial volume, 4 times 10 to the minus 5, is equal to P2 times our final volume of 0.8 times 10 to the minus 5. I would then put that left hand side into your calculator and then divide by the 0.8 times 10 to the minus 5 to get an answer of P2 equals 6.0 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And a quick check here is to see that we have decreased the volume of the gas so we should be increasing the pressure and we have, we've gone from 1.2 to 6 times 10 to the 5. So the option 6.0 times 10 to the 5 pascals is the answer E here. Question 20 says a student makes the following statements about diffraction. Statement 1 says diffraction occurs when waves pass from one medium to another. Statement 2, waves with a longer wavelength diffract more than waves with a shorter wavelength. And statement 3, microwaves diffract more than radio waves. It then says which of these statements is or are correct. Well, let's look through each statement and decide which ones are true or false. So the first one, diffraction occurs when waves pass from one medium to another. That is false because this statement is actually referring to refraction, which is when light waves change speed when they go from one medium to another. But the definition of diffraction, remember, is the bending of a wave through a gap or around an obstacle. Statement 2 says waves with a longer wavelength diffract more than waves with a shorter wavelength. This is indeed true, and that's just a rule that you need to remember, and it's the relationship between wavelength and diffraction, where longer wavelength waves diffract more than shorter wavelength waves. Lastly, statement 3, microwaves diffract more than radio waves. Well, that's going to be false, because remember radio waves have the longest wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum, so that means that they will diffract more than microwaves, which have a shorter wavelength. So we can say that statement 2 is the only correct one here, which gives an answer of B. Question 21 says the diagram shows part of the electromagnetic spectrum arranged in order of increasing wavelength. So we have gamma rays, R, ultraviolet, and visible light, and this is for increasing wavelength from left to right. Which row in the table identifies radiation R and describes its frequency? Well, the way I like to remember this is in the order for decreasing wavelength, so I like to move from right to left, starting with radio and TV waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. So R, my missing one here, is going to be X-rays, which means my answer is going to be either A or C. And in terms of frequency, remember frequency does the opposite to wavelength. So if this is increasing wavelength from left to right, then we must have increasing frequency from right to left. So that means with regards to visible light, R must have a higher frequency than visible light. So we're looking for X-rays and higher frequency than visible light, so our answer here is A. Moving on to question 22, this is a skills question, and it says that the energy of a water wave can be calculated using E equals rho g a squared over 2, where E is the energy of the wave in joules, Rho is the density of the water in kilograms per meter cubed. Rho is just another Greek letter which you might not have come across before. G is the gravitational field strength in newtons per kilogram. And A is the amplitude of the wave in meters. A wave out at sea has an amplitude of 3.5 meters. The density of the sea water is 1.02 times 10 to the 3 kilograms per meter cubed. The energy of the wave is... Well, even though you've not seen this equation before, all you need to do with this kind of question is sub in the numbers that you're given and make sure that the units are the same and that you don't have any prefixes involved. So here we've got rho g a squared over 2 to find the energy. So I'm going to write down my equation, e equals rho g a squared over 2. Subbing in the numbers, we get 1.02 times 10 to the 3 for the density times 9.8 for the gravitational field strength on Earth. Assuming this is all happening on Earth because it would be strange if it wasn't. And that is then times by 3.5 squared which is the amplitude squared divided by 2. So putting all of that into your calculator, not forgetting to square this term here, gives a final answer of 6.1 times 10 to the 4 joules. And you can see that's one of my options here, so the answer is C. Question 23 says that a sample of tissue receives an equivalent dose rate of 0.4 millisieverts per hour from a source of alpha radiation. The equivalent dose received by the sample in 30 minutes is... Where we're given an equivalent dose rate and a time, 
and we want to find the equivalent dose. So we need to use the relationship here between equivalent dose rate, equivalent dose and time, which is h dot equals h over t. And we want to find what h is the equivalent dose. So let's rearrange to get h equals h dot times t and sub in the numbers. You could actually just sub in the numbers at this stage though, if you prefer. Now, because the answer options here are all in millisieverts, I'm just going to keep this millisieverts in the number here, 0.4. But I do also want to use hours for my time because I've got millisieverts per hour here. So 30 minutes in hours is going to be half an hour. So that's 0.5 hours. So I have 0.4 times 0.5. So you can either do that in your calculator or do it in your head. So half of 0.4 is going to be 0.2 millisieverts and you'll see that gives us the answer A. Question 24 says a radioactive source has an initial activity of 200 kilobecquerels. After 12 days, the activity of the source is 25 kilobecquerels. The half-life of the source is. Well, this is a half-life question where we need to use the numerical method because we're given some numbers here. So we're told the time here of 12 days, we're told the initial activity of 200 kilobecquerels and the final activity of 25 kilobecquerels. So I'm going to start by writing down my initial activity of 200 kilobecquerels and I'm then going to keep halving this number until I get to the 25 kilobecquerels. So halving at once, I get 100 kilobecquerels. Halving again, I get 50 kilobecquerels. Having that gives me 25 kilobecquerels, which is where I want to stop because that's my final activity. So I've halved it three times. I've got three arrows, which means I've got three half-lives. So I can say that in 12 days, I had three half-lives. So three half-lives is equal to 12 days. So in order to find one half-life, I just need to divide both sides here by three. So one half-life is equal to 12 over three, which is four days. And you'll see that gives me the answer B here. Lastly, question 25 says that in the following passage, some words have been replaced by the letters X, Y, and Z. During a nuclear something reaction, two nuclei of smaller mass number combine to produce a nucleus of larger mass number. These reactions take place at very something temperatures and are important because they can release something. Which row in the table shows the missing words? Well, the idea of two nuclei of smaller mass combining to produce a larger nucleus, that suggests nuclear fusion because we've got two things fusing together. So it's going to be fusion. So I'm looking at options A, B, or E here, and we can eliminate C and D because they're talking about fission. These reactions take place at very something temperatures. Well, our options are high or low, but it's going to be very high temperatures because remember nuclear fusion occurs in plasma and plasma has a very high temperature, higher than any known material. And lastly, these reactions are important because they can release something. So remember nuclear fission and fusion reactions both release energy in order to heat up water in a nuclear fission reaction to produce steam. And then that steam can drive turbines, which in turn can drive a generator and produce electricity. So X we said was fusion, Y we said was high, and Z we said was energy. So we have fusion, high, and energy, so that is answer B. That's all for this video, folks. Thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.